you know, we all have that resilience within us. It just comes from deep within us and the support around us. And um, I remember thinking there has got to be more to life than feeling this way. Welcome back to Crafted Entrepreneur. In this episode, I am joined by a woman with an incredible story of perseverance. I have Amberly Lago with us. She's going to teach us all about her recovery from a life-changing motorcycle accident and how she's gone on to help people grow their influence, increase their impact and their income. And she's made a full-blown career in motivational speaking. So she's a peak performance coach, a podcaster, and a leading expert in the field of resilience and transformation. She's also the author of True Grit and Grace. and She's the founder of Unstoppable Life Mastermind. So I'm really, really pumped to have Amberly with us today. Amberly, welcome to the show. Oh my goodness. I'm so grateful to be talking with you. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Do you know, I just realized this. I looked on Instagram. I was going to message you and we connected back in like 2019. Oh my goodness. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that is crazy. I feel like I make Instagram friends and then we, we don't meet in real life. So we're finally meeting in real life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. And hopefully, um, well, my husband and I have been talking about maybe moving back to California eventually, Ooh. not sure, but hopefully I'll get to see you and go hiking with you or something in person. Yes. Yes. Or you could always just fly in for a hike, you know? Yeah. That's, I, that's- I was flying in just to have my hair done. I'm not kidding. Oh my gosh. I love Is that it. crazy? I know that's crazy. <laughs> that sounds so crazy, but it's hard to find a good hair person. I know. Well, you know, what's so funny is my mom just moved in. She lives, she's uh, from Bakersfield, which is where I'm from too. And we've been, only been in Newport for five years and she finally just moved in. We have like a little extra house and she's a hairstylist. And so, you know, ever since I've been away from her, it's been like, oh my gosh, mom, I want you to do my hair. And now she's living like right here. So I'm like, oh my goodness, she's going to do my hair all the time. After this oh. podcast, she's going to trim my hair because I, it is, it's like, once you have that person that you trust with like Part of your identity, almost your hair. <laughs> so I get that, but I'm excited to have you on because you have done so much in your career and, you know, it really started from a place of tragedy. Almost. You have such a powerful story. So back in 2010, you had a motorcycle accident that changed your life. What happened that day and what did your recovery journey look like? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. You know, I had a really successful career, um, in the fitness industry. I used to help other trainers get certified for, to be a trainer. I had several trainers that I employed and I was doing infomercials and sponsored by Nike and health magazine and shape magazine, doing regular articles on fitness and it was my life. Running was my therapy. I loved it. And so one day I had ran 11 miles in my best time. And I was so happy because I had a running partner and it was the first time I actually beat him. (sighs) And so I'm on my way home from work. I'd finished training clients, done my best run. I hop on my Harley and I'm cruising down Ventura and this SUV shoots out of a parking lot and T-bones me. I get thrown 30 feet and I'm sliding across the asphalt. And when I finally came to a stop, I looked down at my leg and it was just crumbled into pieces. And I just held onto my leg. I was actually, I felt like my leggings were the only thing holding it together. And I did not want to let go of my leg and try to get my phone because I really thought my leg was going to fall off my body. That's how extreme it was. There was blood everywhere. I didn't realize it was my femoral artery that was severed. One of my first thoughts was, oh, this can't be good. I might be on crutches for a while. I had no idea just how this was going to change the rest of my life. Luckily, paramedics got there right away. I had a guy come, come over and take his belt off and make a tourniquet on my oh, leg. He, he saved so my life. So smart that he knew to do that. Oh my goodness. Wow. Cause I didn't realize that, you know, 
and thank goodness I didn't realize when your femoral artery is severed, you could bleed out very quickly. And so he really saved my life and the paramedics got there so fast. And so I was taken to the hospital and it was chaotic. I heard this crying and realized it was my husband. Now he is a big, strong, tough guy. He's a first responder. He was a Lieutenant commander for the highway patrol and I had never seen him cry. And I yelled across the ER, honey, get over here. I need you to be strong for me. Because in that moment I thought I might be dying and I need to know he's going to be able to pull it together for our kids. And that's, he came over and held my hand. And that's really the last thing I remember before they put me in induced coma. And, uh, I woke up a little over a week later. And the first thing I learned was I had a 1% chance of saving my leg from amputation. They said, you know, this is basically a war wound. There's nothing we can do for you. So we're going to have to amputate. And I was like, well, wait a minute. You said there's a 1% chance So Mm -hmm. there's still a chance and I want to find a doctor who's willing to take that chance with me. And let me tell you, it took an act of God. It took so much grit. It ended up totaling 34 surgeries and they piece by piece, surgery by surgery, put my leg back together. And that was the beginning of my healing journey. And I, I really thought the worst was over. And then I was diagnosed as a result of the accident with an incurable nerve disease called complex regional pain syndrome. And that is where the healing journey truly began because I was told from this nerve disease that I would never walk again, that I needed to just stay in my wheelchair. I would never work again. I'd be permanently disabled. And so it took me going down a really dark path and being depressed and turning to alcohol to numb out to, you know, finally going through, you know, therapy and a lot of self-development, a lot of prayer and getting sober back in 2016 and completely reinventing myself and doing what I do now. And it's a lot of it started with just being in radical acceptance for kind of the cards I had been dealt for uh, a lot of the things that I was doing that weren't healthy. So I could take action steps to start to make my life better. Being in such pain and having all of these things that people would say were coming against you, right? Like all of these diagnoses, what was your motivation to get up and like say, okay, I'm going to radically, radically accept the cards that I've been dealt? I think that it was one day when I was laying in my hospital bed. So we had a, a two story house and we had a hospital. I couldn't, it was, I, I couldn't keep my leg down. So I could go upstairs if I would sit on my butt and scoop myself up backwards and hold one leg up in the air. which seems kind of crazy, I know, but I just so wanted to go upstairs and be able to pick out my own clothes. But we had a hospital bed set up in the living room. And one day I was just looking down at my leg that was all scarred and deformed. And I started just thinking, what am I going to do? We had $2.9 million worth of medical expenses and we had a lien on our house And I was the main breadwinner and I was out of work. And I was just thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? And then I heard this little voice and it was my daughter. She was two years old at the time. And all she said was mama. And in that moment, I knew why I was going to get through it. And I was going to be an example of resilience for my kids and I was not going to be the victim of my circumstances. I was going to be the victor of my resiliency, a product of my resiliency. And I think, you know, we all have that resilience within us. It just comes from deep within us and the support around us. And um, I just thought that I remember thinking there has got to be more to life than feeling this way. And um, it was hard to accept my new normal. It wasn't easy. I didn't, I hated the way that I looked, you know, I went from modeling and doing fitness videos and being sponsored by Nike to now my legs deformed, my ankles fused. It's completely made of metal. I'm scarred from the hip down. 
So it wasn't just the pain that was hard in this disease diagnosis that was hard to accept, but it was the scars and everything. Uh And sometimes I think that we need people to love us until we can love ourselves and to accept us until we can accept ourselves. And to me, one of the things that really shifted the way that I looked at myself and, and I was able to love myself and accept being acceptance was my doctor. I'd gone in, I was like, Hey, Dr. Wiss, I appreciate you doing the 34 surgeries to save my leg, but it's just giving me too much pain. We need to go ahead and cut it off. And he said, we can't do that. You've got complex regional pain syndrome. It could spread. It could make it worse. And then he did something that changed my life. He took my leg and he put it in his lap and he looked at it like it was a masterpiece, like it was a work of art and something shifted in me. And I thought, wow, if he can look at my leg like that, like he's so proud of it, maybe I can learn to accept it and look at it differently too. And it wasn't easy, but it's possible little by little, one day at a time and one step at a time that I started to be able to accept and look at my scars so different as, as more of the battles that I had won, like all I had overcome. And so now it's crazy. I don't really even see the the scars. I had to get in radical acceptance about the the nerve disease, which I'm kind of emotional about, just because oh, it's so frustrating. Like I went to my doctor yesterday and they want to do another surgery on me. Now I've had oh, wow. every kind of treatment. I've had a spinal stimulator. At one time I was doing ketamine infusions. I've taken Eastern Western treatments. At one time I was on 73 homeopathic pills and 11 different prescriptions at one time. And just yesterday the doctor was like, well, we're going to schedule another spinal stimulator. And I was like, I've already tried that. And that was a horrible experience. And he's like, well, next month we're going to schedule your surgery. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, no, no, I've get, I've got events that I've already signed contracts for and some that I've already been prepaid to show up at. And he's like, well, you'll just have to cancel the events. And I'm like, uh, (gasps) hello, do you not hear me? That's not going to happen. Like, yeah, my husband's retired. I'm the one that's paying the bills. You know what I mean? And so it was so frustrating to have a doctor just tell you, yeah, we're going to implant metal leads in your spine. Like it or not, that's what's happening. I'm like, you know what? I think it's time for me to find another doctor. And I think that's something I've learned. Mm -hmm. You got to be your own advocate. You got to stand up for what you feel is right. But yeah, it's it's tough when you're diagnosed with some kind of a disease and, and you're used to being healthy and going and, and right. not having direct. And I've had to learn to listen to my body. You know, it's so powerful to look at you. And I'm looking at, if you're not watching this on YouTube right now, she has a sign behind her that says true grit and grace. It's the name of her book. And you know, she's, this is the example, like she's living, she's living out true grit and grace because you do it with, so I watch you on Instagram and you do it with such a lightness about you you know, you would know, you would have no idea that you're struggling the way that you're struggling with pain. And that being said, I feel like you have a support system around you that's helped you. And so how has having this diagnosis, you're killing it as a motivational speaker and you're, you know, your husband's retired. How has this changed the relationships in your life for better, for worse? What does that look like? Oh, well, I learned that community and connection is probably the most important thing for you to be resilient. And I've learned that the hard way, like I I had a lot of misconceptions about asking for help. I had misconceptions about grit. You know, I, I mistook health scares for heroic acts. I mistook sacrifice for success. I mistook like fear for function. And I realized that relationships are everything. Proximity really is power and you don't have to do it alone. And I realized that grit without connection or community is just resistance. And you just feel like you're clawing your way to the top. Like you're just hitting roadblocks or rock bottoms. I I hit a rock bottom to trying to do it alone. And I realized grit with connection is where you truly find 
your resilience. That's where the magic is. That's where the fulfillment is. And so relationship wise, how it's changed me is me being able to go after my dreams, even though I was told I would never work again, that I would never walk again. I thought I had, oh my goodness, Kayla, I had nothing. I had, I didn't even own a laptop six years ago. I had no social media. No. And I remember, you know, going, wanting to write a book And telling a few people and they're like, well, you're crazy. You don't even have a college education. You just need to stick to the the fitness stuff. And you don't even own a computer. Like, what are you thinking? And um, I think it's really important to seek counsel and not opinion. Meaning if you go to somebody and ask them for input or and they've never, if you want to write a book and they've never written a book, mm-hmm. well, of course they're going to tell you, oh, that's not possible. Well, they don't know how it's possible. They, they've they never done it themselves. Exactly. It was when I went to somebody who had published like 75 books, they're like, oh yeah, sure. This is what you do. And it was when I went and took a class in LA, actually, his name's Jack Grapes. And the only class I could take was on a Wednesday, which was their advanced class. Cause the other times were like when I had my daughters with me or, you know, or I was working and, and I was so intimidated. I walked in that class and there were like famous authors, published screenplay writers. I mean, it, they were legit, like qualified to be there. And I was like, well, here I am. Yeah. And we had to do a homework assignment. We had to, to, write out our first assignment and we had to get up in front of the class and read. And I remember getting my paper and I was shaking. My hands were shaking the paper. I was so scared. And after I read, I sat down, I just kind of collapsed and I was crying. And he's like, Amberly, why did you take my class? And I was like, because I want to write a book. And he's like, well, you will write a book. After hearing what you just wrote, you will write a book. You may be intimidated by people in this class, but let me tell you, after hearing that, they're intimidated by you. And not that I wanted people to be intimidated by me, but after that, it was like people started to like be my friend a little bit, you know what I mean? (laughs) But just having that community of writers is what helped me spurred me along writing my book. Having a community of sober sisters is what helps me stay sober. Um, And then, you know, I'm in a mastermind, but I have my mastermind. I have a mastermind for women because I want to show other women that they can go after their big dreams and goals and they can build their influence and impact. And I want to share what I've done because I didn't really have that kind of guidance when I started, I was really just pulling up my bootstraps, trying to do what I could. But I think that community and connection is, is truly where the resilience is. That's where the magic is. I believe in that so much. I always say like your relationship capital is worth more than any other capital out there. And, you know, so you, you have really built this empire around you. I mean, you're one of the most like sought after motivational speakers out there. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you came highly recommended by Catherine Gordon. And then I was like watching a ton of your stuff and I'm like, wow, she's incredible. You've made this full blown career from speaking. Can you tell me, you know, how did your first gig, I'm going to say gig come about? And then how did you turn it into a stream of income? Well, thank you. So I had no intentions, like I had no intention on becoming a speaker. I would be at the gym. People saw me at the gym working out from my wheelchair, working out like with a walker, walk, working out with crutches, then limping, then back in a wheelchair because I would go surgery after surgery, but I would still work out. And so I would be on the bike. I would go and, and get, do the bike, do whatever I could to to stay strong and keep muscle on. And people would just come up one after another and tell me all their problems and I would offer solutions. And I had this lady next to me say, 
wow, do you ever get tired of people coming up and telling you all their problems and ailments? And I was like, no, because I can help them and I can inspire them. So then I started having people go, hey, will you talk to my church group? Hey, will you talk to my rehab group? Hey, will you talk? And I was like, I had never done a, a talk. So I went to someone who used to work with people like she worked with Paula Abdul and and I said, Hey, I don't know how to put together a talk. And I've been invited to go do this talk. And so she was like, okay, we're going to help you do that. And they uh, said, and by the way, we want you to come speak to our networking group. And it's a bunch of realtors, bankers, lawyers, and, and investors. And I was like, okay. So I didn't even own a suit. All I had was workout clothes. And I had to go to Nordstrom's and I said, I need to buy a suit. And they said, well, what size are you? I said, I don't even know. I've never, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I didn't have that many things to even, I was like, I have workout clothes. That's all I have. <laughs> and um, I did my first talk at that networking group. From that, I got asked to speak to another networking group. From that networking group, I got asked to speak to another group. And it was all just word of mouth. And then I was speaking to the Betty Ford Clinic. And then I was speaking to rehabs. And then I was speaking to a school. And then I was like, okay, I like this. What I like about it is the connections that I make. Like when I see people in the audience that have that breakthrough moment when I'm, I'm sharing tips on how to be resilient. And so... I started really searching like, well, who's the best motivational speaker out there? I was like, well, Mel Robbins is the the top female motivational speaker. I was like, well, how can I be more like her? What is she doing? And one day on her story, she posted that she was going to speak at some event. So I went to that event page and I sent them a voice memo and I was like, Hey, it looks like you have an incredible event coming up. I am an author. I'm a speaker. I would love to be there. I'll support you any way I can. If you need me to sweep the floors, I'll do that. But I'm there to be of service. And here's my phone number. They called me. And they called me and said, well, as you can imagine, our, our lineup we've worked on for a year and we were completely booked out. They had Jay Shetty, Lewis Howes, wow. Mel Robbins, um, Brendan Burchard, Dean Graziosi. They had like the top speakers. They said, but if you advertise that, you know, our event, we'll give you a VIP ticket. And I said, well, hey, look, I don't want to tell my people to come to an event that I'm not a part of can I at least sell my books in the back of the room? They said, well, you know, the owner isn't letting anybody sell stuff at the conference, but I'll ask and I'll get back to you. Do you know, they call me back five minutes later. They're like, well, are you sitting down? And I was like, yep. And the owner is going to actually let you speak and going to let you sell your books right next to our booth at the conference. And I was like, oh my gosh. Well, when I got to that event, I realized that the owner told me, he said, he said, you can imagine all the people that were wanting to come speak at our event. He said, but yours was the little pushback that I was looking for. Cause I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll help you promote your event, but now, how can I be a part of it? Now I still want to be a part of it. Even if that's like, in the back corner so I can tell people to come meet me there, see me there. And so that was my first, probably my first big speaking event. I knew I was the only one there that back then when verified was a thing on Instagram, I was the only speaker that wasn't verified. I knew no one, nobody knew who I was. I was like, there every moment I could to help backstage. And so I was like, I'm here, whatever you need, I'm your girl. Do you know, I was upstairs just praying, like, please, Lord, help me get through this talk. The phone rings and this event was in Salt Lake City and it was a Salt Lake City area code. And I answered, they said, hey, our next speaker is, is we don't know where he is. 
can you get down here and go on stage right now? I was like, I am your girl. I am there. I put my boots on and I like booked it to the backstage. And because I was there, I got to be on when people were expecting this famous speaker to come Mm -hmm. on. So they were all amped up. Everybody was in the room. And so everybody was in the room. And so it's about showing up. It's about paying your dues. I can't tell you how many times I flew across the country. I bought my ticket. I bought my hotel room. I spoke for free for the experience to make the connections to, to just, you know, I paid my dues. So, it, cause I never got into it for the money. I got into it cause I really wanted to make an impact. Now, if, when I make money, I'm just like, wow, I, I really show my husband because he, he was always like, when are you going to make money at this? And now I'm just like, here, honey, here's another check. Here's <laughs> another check. You know what I mean? But I, uh, um, I love to, to teach others how I've done things now and other women how, and that's what I do in my mastermind. I give people a stage because that's Mm. what you need. Everybody wants a stage and everybody does need a stage to share their message. I mean, I think that's what makes people the most fulfilled is sharing like that, that special thing they have inside of them that they know is going to impact other people. Yeah. It's just using your voice to make that different, you know? I want to know, like, so you go on this stage, right? And you're you're like, this is your first time ever doing it. And how did you like craft your, your, your speech? Did you, or was it like just downloads from the Lord and you're just like going out there? I mean, what did it look like to get prepared for this moment? Yeah. Oh, I was so nervous. I was, I still get so nervous and it's so crazy because I don't know why I can, I can talk to somebody and I can help them craft their talk like that. It's so fun for me. It's so, it comes naturally for me to go, yep, this, 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 these are your three bullet points. For me, I start, I have to remind myself to get out of my head and stay in my heart that this is not about me, Mm -hmm. that this is about the people that I serve. And then the very first big talk that I did I did. I forgot to mention one key thing. They were giving me five minutes. Now people were like, weren't you upset? They were only giving you five minutes. I was like, no, I was so grateful. They were giving me five minutes on stage. So that was my moment that I could say, I'm hanging out backstage with Mel Robbins and Lewis Howes and yeah, I was grateful for that five minutes. So I memorized and crafted that five minutes because they said, if you take longer than five minutes, we will pull you off stage. And I was like, yes, sir. (laughs) Um, And then I got a TED talk, which is totally different from any other kind of talk you have. I had 14 minutes to share the most important message of my life. And they said two things. I thought they were going to help me curate it. No, (laughs) they gave me two pieces of of advice. They said, don't talk about God and don't talk about your accident too much. And I'm like, okay, well, the message I'm sharing, the lesson I learned is from my accident and God was a big part of it. But they're like, you're talking to a bunch of scientists and doctors, so you have to really keep it, throw some statistics in there. You know, so it was totally different. Now I will tell you free listening, how you want to share your message, whether you're doing an introduction for yourself, an elevator pitch, you're doing a 15 minute talk, or you're doing an hour long keynote. I just got booked to do an hour and a half keynote. And I'm like, wow, whoo. I think we could take some time for some Q and A because that would be <laughs> that would be good by me. But I always say start by sharing what your your biggest pain point is or what your hook is. What is the biggest lesson that you've learned? And that could be something about you that something that you've overcome, or it could be something that's going on in the world today that everybody can relate to. Then share three things of how you got through that moment and then share the benefit of what it is going to do for your listener. Because let's face it, the listener, whoever is watching you, they ultimately 
they want to know what's in it for them. So share the obstacle, share the solution, then share the benefit. And then, you know, I had, um, a, a friend of mine that did her first podcast interview and she said, could you listen to this and give me some tips on how to do, you know, interviews? Is it, was this okay? And I listened to it and I said, well, just so you know, you spent 90% of the time talking about your obstacle. So you were just talking about how bad it was for like almost an hour. I said, then, then at the very end, you said, do this one thing. And then you didn't even say how it was going to benefit them. I said, so you're going to lose your audience. I was like, yeah, tell your compelling story, but really focus in on your three points that you want to get across Storytell. I always love storytelling. I always learn so much from people who tell great stories. And, you know, Catherine Gordon, who connected us, she spoke at my last event and she, she was in my, one of my first masterminds and she is such a great storyteller. I mean, just a natural storyteller. She, yeah, she is. She's like captivating about like everything she's, every story she says. I'm like, oh, yeah. And, and of course, John, her husband is, he's probably, I would say one of, if not my most favorite speakers. I want to hear him. Oh my gosh. Look on YouTube. And John Gordon is just such a great storyteller. He is like so legit. He's been doing this forever. He's been speaking on stages forever. So he has got it down. Would you say that like listening to other people tell stories helps you get better? Is that like a good practice that speakers or podcasters should be in? Well, I think that, yeah, I think that if you're going to do a podcast or you're going to interview on podcasts that you should definitely listen to successful podcasts like yours and learn from you to see how you're doing your podcast. If you want to be a better speaker, like if you're, when I did my Ted talk, I was like, okay, what is a Ted talk? Like what, what is that? What is it? it like, I, I better watch some really good Ted talks and get an idea. But then if you listen to too much outside stuff, I think you, it gets confusing or overwhelming. Um, and so you know, I had somebody, I, I was speaking at an event and they were like, well, we saved you seats in the audience in the front. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't like to go out in the audience until after I've finished speaking. And they're like, why? I said, because I start hearing other people talk and I'm like, oh, that, I was going to say that, or, oh, I should say that, or, oh, yeah. maybe I should add that in. So I think it's really important to go inward. Um, I always do, you know, to prepare right before I go on stage, two things. I pray and I do push-ups. I was going to say, I saw you on your Instagram doing that. <laughs> that gets, gets me ready. And I think that so much of it is, yeah, knowing your key points. I don't ever have a talk completely memorized. And I don't like when I, I sometimes like the last talk I did, I was at a big event and I was in my head a little bit more. I wanted, I was like, Amberly, stay in your heart. But I was like, there was a lot going on between, I couldn't see the audience at all. And I love seeing people and it kind of throws me off when I feel like I'm just staring into the Bright lights. Like it, <laughs> I couldn't see anything or staring at myself on camera. That is really hard. That's something that I've really had to practice. And so I love seeing people because I feel like I connect more. It was crazy when I did my TED talk. So it was a sold out event. It was the Berkeley's 10 year anniversary. And it was my first big talk. First time I'd ever been on a stage like that for any length of time other than five minutes. And I wasn't, you know, I practiced my talk over and over because I had to have it nailed down in 14 minutes. And I wasn't prepared of like, when I was, would talk and the audience laughed or they were like, oh, you could hear them gasp or they're, you know, clapped in the middle. And I was like, I kind of stopped and I was like, oh, <laughs> they're, oh, for you. they're, oh okay, yeah. they're with me. They're with me. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And it just made you feel more connected. 
but I, I love it because of the connections that you make. That's been the best part of my whole journey. Is all the, is all the amazing people you meet along the way? Oh yeah. Okay. So you've taken this public speaking, it's become a career for you. You're making money from it. Now you have your mastermind and you also have your book. Would you say that your book is still something, I mean, I see it in the back right there. So it's like something you're still popping out and promoting to people. So we're definitely going to have it in the show notes here, but what would you say to those people who are listening in right now? They're all aspiring speakers, but they're also probably all aspiring authors as well. What would you say to those people that are interested in writing? Oh my goodness. I, yeah, I guess there's 81% of people want to write a book. 1% actually do it. Wow. I did not know that statistic. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I, I am, I'm going to tell you, this is your sign if you want to write a book to do it. Because I, like I said, I didn't own a computer. I wrote 90% of my book on a notepad. I love notepads, like on a notepad, and then bought my computer to type it up and start with while I was writing my book, I ended up getting a publisher. I had a friend that said, do you want to go to a conference with me? It's for aspiring authors. And I was like, and she goes, if we split it, it'll only cost you a hundred dollars. And I'm like, how good can this conference be if it's only a hundred dollars? That was my thought. <laughs> like, I was like a three day conference for a hundred bucks. Like, that's crazy. Well, I ended up going, and, and let me tell you, you never know who you're going to meet along the way. And so I go to this conference and I say that I got my publisher because I was kind, because <laughs> I held the elevator door open for this guy who was running. He comes in the elevator. He's kind of sweaty. And um, he said, thank you so much. I'm running late. I'm like, oh, no problem. And so we get upstairs and he's with a publishing company. And he's, I was like, oh, fancy meeting you here. And he goes, do you have a, a manuscript? And I said, well, I do. I, it's not quite finished. And he goes, well, look talk to me about it or send, get me some of it. I had prepared copies of part of my manuscript to take to this conference because I knew there was going to be a time where we could meet literary agents and we could meet publishers. And it was like speed dating for aspiring authors. We had three minutes at each table to talk to these people. And it was like an all, all day, 12 hours there. I hadn't eaten anything. I was exhausted. I get to the very last table and I sit down in front of this guy and he goes, well, did you go grab me your, your part of your manuscript? And I said, no, sir, I didn't. And I was like, he was like, well, well, why? I said, oh, I'm scared. He goes, I tell you what, I'm going to give you a book. He handed me a book about how to write a proposal. He said, here's my card. Give me a call when you're ready. And I gave him my card. That was back when we had business cards, like actual business cards. And um, I think maybe because I was just completely transparent with him, you know, and I got back home and my phone rang and the area code said New York City. And I thought, well, I better answer this. This is New York City calling. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I answer it and it's him. And he's oh. like, hey, I want to read your manuscript. And um, I had told him that if he ever got to L.A., let me know. I'd love to have him and his wife over for dinner. So when I answered the phone and it was him, I said, oh, are you in town? Do you want to come from for dinner? And he goes, no, I want to read your book. <laughs> and so I sent it to him. And lo and behold, they said yes, they wanted to publish wow. it. Wow. And, um, they said, but we don't do any marketing for you. If you want to get it out there, you'll have to do it yourself. I didn't have a lot of money at the time. And so I did what I could. So I started building my personal brand with how I could through Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. And this is before TikTok or before, you know, anybody my age was on TikTok anyway. And I, my goal was within a year to get 10,000 followers. Cause back then, if you had 10,000 followers, you could do a swipe up. And in a year I had built my Instagram following to just over 10,000 followers. And I, that was, I was like, I'm not buying followers. 
I don't want fake followers. I want the real deal. And I would spend an average of probably three hours a day just on Instagram. And that's how I built the community that I had. And that is how I sold out at every single book signing was because for a whole year, all I did was add value, add value, add value. Then at the end of the year, my book was coming out. And I was like, hey, guys, my book is here. Will you come meet me at the Barnes and Noble? Will you come meet me at Books and Books? I don't want to be the only person there. Please just come hug my neck. Do you know Books and Books, after my book signing, we sold out of books. Every location, one location we sold out three times. That was in L.A. They asked my husband to go back to the, our house and get boxes of book, and they bought books off of us, which they said they never do. I'm only sharing this not to be like, oh, I'm so great. I sold all these books. I'm sharing it because if I can do it, anybody can do it. It just takes the persistence and the grit and the sharing and adding value. And I didn't have, you know, big fancy, like next time I do a book launch, I will have something more, you know, planned out. I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going for it though. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, find somebody who's done it before you find, you know, seek counsel, seek out the, the guidance of somebody who has achieved what you aspire to achieve and watch how they did it or learn from them, coach with them, um, yeah. whatever it takes. And, um, but I, seriously, just start writing. And if it just takes journaling, journaling is such a great tool for you to get but and, and dedicate time and give yourself grace, because if you're anything like me, thoughts came up of, you know, oh, well, I just don't I don't know if anybody's going to want to hear this. Who's going to want to read this? And then after I published it, I was like, oh, my gosh, all the PTA moms are going to know my deepest, darkest secrets. Like they're all going to know, you know, <laughs> but like I said, the truth, the truth will set you free. So I encourage anyone listening to start writing. I love that. It's such a good reminder that you could just journal just to get in the habit of writing. Now, when you say add value, what does that look like in today's day and age? Because I know when I started on my social media, I went live every single day and I feel like it doesn't, it doesn't have the same power as it did, you know, five years ago, five or six years ago when I was going like every day, it's, I don't know, people caught on and more people do it. <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? And, and also there was a period of time where I feel like I was really, growing. Like I was constantly just, my Instagram was growing and growing and growing. And now I feel like they make, it's harder. I don't know if it's, there's more people on, I don't know, but yeah, I feel, I feel the same. And a lot of people have kind of caught on to the whole going live thing. But when I, I think of adding value, I think of picking out like four topics that I talk about most, you know, like whether it is, entrepreneurship, complex regional pain syndrome, sobriety, um, being a mom and a wife, whatever topics like stick to like at first, I just talked about how to get through pain, like things that I did to get through pain mentally, physically, health wise. And so I had a large community of like chronic pain warriors, CRPS warriors, people that lived with a lot of chronic pain. Well, I don't know. Were you on Clubhouse when Clubhouse came yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. I was on Clubhouse and I did two rooms. I had one room that was for entrepreneurs and another room that was for chronic pain, like thrivers is what I like to call it. And I noticed that I would just get lit up in the room with entrepreneurship, just like it gave me so much energy and in the room talking about pain, even though I was trying to be positive about it, it was draining. And so I think it's really important to pick something that lights you up and stick to that. I recently had somebody say to me, you know, you used to talk about CRPS a lot more. How come you don't really talk about it as much anymore? She said, uh, 
you know, with a platform like yours, you should really talk about it a lot more. And I wanted to say, you know what, <laughs> you do you and I'll do yeah. me. But exactly. because to talk about pain, you, it makes me focus on the pain. Right. More. Right. You know what I mean? And so I like to talk about the things that light me up. So I've kind of, I, I think that's one of the reasons my Instagram has slowed down a little bit because my audience is kind of shifted a little bit. You're, you're pivoting to the thing that lights you up. I'm in the, it's funny, Amberly. I'm in the same boat in a different way, just because I've been talking about making money and, you know, social selling and all of those things I've been doing for the last 12 years. And now all I want to do is talk about real estate. It's the thing, investing in real estate. It's the thing that lights me up. And my audience is going, Hmm, like they haven't caught up to the pivot yet. They haven't realized that they can come along this new journey too. So, oh, I so you're it. experiencing the same. Okay. Yeah. It's, Interesting. it's, yeah, it's almost like a rebrand. Yeah. Some people are like evolving with me and some people, you know, aren't catching on. I haven't lost followers, but definitely like the engagement has gone down and I'm like, it's okay. Because like the people that are excited about what I'm excited about, it's just like, you know, 10 years ago when I was first building, they're going to find me. You just got to keep putting out that good content, but you're right. It's about like that enthusiasm, you know, of what you gives you life. That's what draws so many people to you. So you just got to keep being, you know, talking about the things that light you up. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great point. And, you know, I just had this conversation with one of the ladies in my mastermind because all she keeps saying is I just hate Instagram. I hate it. And, and she's like, you know, I don't know why my event isn't selling. I'm talking about it on Instagram. And I'm like, because people can tell that you hate Instagram. They right. feel it. You can feel like if you do, if you hate, like hate's a four letter word, that's a pretty strong word. If you hate it that much, don't do it. Go hang out on Facebook. If that's where your people are, like go where your people are. For me, it just happened to be more so on Instagram. I seem to have more engagement, but yeah, my engagement used to be like, I would average, you know, seven to a thousand comments per post. And now it's like, I'm averaging 200 comments. Wow. But you know, let's still point out that she's still getting paid speaking gigs. And so sometimes we get so focused on these engagements and all this stuff, but it's like, you're still going to the bank. You know, like you're still getting your paid still speaking. Still going to the bank. Yeah, Finally. you still have your mastermind filled up and your book is still selling. And so it's so important to like just focus on those things that actually matter, right? And I think that's where like anybody that's listening to this right now, it's like we can go down that and we'll talk about it forever. Like, oh my gosh, the engagement, da, 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 da. But it's like, okay, what is working for you right now? And what is the thing that like you're most excited about selling? What is the thing that you're most excited about when it comes to your message and your impact that you're leaving on the world? Just go focus on doing more of that, right? Go focus on giving more value in that way, putting in the, the grit that she's put in and, and networking and, you know, spending three hours a day on Instagram. I mean, that's what, that's what you did to get it to where it is right now. Like, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I don't spend three hours a day on Instagram anymore, but I right. did that in the beginning because I knew that it would eventually pay off that I would build a genuine audience. And you and had friends. that hope, right? You had that hope where you're like, okay, it's worth it for me to, to go and put in this sweat equity. And that's where I think people have to have that. Like, okay, if you believe in this platform, you've, you've got to just like go and have a good attitude about it, you know, and things will change. Yeah. And, and also I want everybody to know, like, Sometimes it looks like, oh, success is easier. That person is an overnight success or whatever. And the thing is, they don't like you don't a lot of times see the blood, sweat and tears that went on beforehand, you know, or Absolutely. the and, and the reason I share that I spent that much time on Instagram at the beginning is because like a lot of times people think that they could just post and ghost and the people will come. And it's like, no, you got to go out there and try to find your people. You yes. know, you have to add value. But all, in the same with speaking, you know, my husband would be like, when are you going to get paid? And I was like, trust me, honey, just 
trust me, I have a plan. I'm, I'm building this up and eventually it is going to pay, but just trust. And so I knew I had this plan. I had this vision and I kept, kept it up. Same when I started my mastermind, I made no money on my mastermind the first year like oh, wow. zero, like broke even and all that. Were, and my husband was like, why are you doing this? Like you basically did that for free. And I was like, no, I did not do that for free. I was like, I got great testimonials. I got great video. I got great people that signed up again. I got great referrals and I had a plan. Like I wanted to over deliver on that. So it would be the most amazing experience so could I, I could get those testimonials and I had a plan. And so yes. I think sometimes that you need to keep that hope, keep taking steps forward and know that eventually it will pay off. Your hard work puts you where your blessings can find you. That's a quote right there. Yes. Your hard work puts you where your blessings can find you. I love that, Amberly. Well, where can everybody find you? Because I think people are going to go, oh, okay, how can I go eat up all of Amberly's stuff right now? <laughs> oh, well, thank you again for having me on. You can find, and you're going to be on my podcast too. I don't know when we have it scheduled, but I think it's coming up. But yeah. you can uh, find the podcast, the book at amberlylago.com. You can check out the mastermind at truegritandgrace.com. And um, I hang out primarily like behind the scenes shenanigans on Instagram at Amberly Lago Motivation. And I can't wait to have you on the show. I have so many questions for you <laughs> that I'm like <laughs> holding myself back that I just want to ask you now. But are you primarily on Instagram as well? Or, or what is your main social media platform? Yeah, I would say I do all three, TikTok, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. And I'm now, I really kind of want to focus on LinkedIn because I'm going, I, I, you know, I want to, I'm pivoting and I'm going, okay, where are my real estate and my accredited investors? And a lot of them are on LinkedIn. So I'm learning that's that. That's true. Platform. That's where they are for sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really trying to lean into that. And, but I love being, I love social media, you know, so I'm everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm everywhere. I, I, I do too. I like it. I just, I'm still kind of working on TikTok. Um, I'm only on TikTok because my daughter told me I was too old to be on TikTok. So I was like, well, then I'm definitely getting on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah, we all need to get on TikTok before they like shut it down in America. So I know, right? Juice out of it. Yep. So we'll make sure to link everything up in the show notes. Amberly, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I got so much. I mean, we talked about writing a book. We talked about becoming a public speaker and then, you know, everything that you faced challenge wise, just having that mindset is everything. So I can't wait for people to pick up your book. And if you take a screenshot of this podcast episode right now, tag both me and Amber Lee on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you're, you're, you like to post, I'm going to pick 10 lucky winners to give true grit and grace to. So all you have to do is tag us. Remember the first 10 people that tag us are going to get a free book. Oh my gosh. I love that. See, I'm learning from you. I'm going to start doing that on my podcast. See? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I'm excited for people to get your book in their hands. Thank you so much. 